You're listening to Errol Parker and Clancy Overall, editors of the Batuta Advocate on Desert Rock FM. Hello and welcome to the Batuta Advocate podcast, beaming out of the Channel Country. My name is Wendell Hussey. It is not the familiar voice of Clancy Overall leading off. He's down at a function in Brisbane, a Broncos function, I believe. And then I think he's also going to the Dolphins function as well. He's got a big weekend. Rugby League has started again, which is a big deal here in the state of Queensland. I'm opening the show here with Effie Bateman, Euphemia Bateman even. Um, Hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Wendell? I'm good. I'm good. I believe you're particularly excited to I'm talk to so the guest that we have on today. She's a writer and a researcher based in Melbourne, Australia, our favourite city, far and away. Really good relationship with Melbourne, we do. It's the as, allergy uh, the capital advocate. of the world, apparently. Whenever I go there, I have the worst hay fever. It's awful. It's the everything mm. capital of the world, I think. But that's where our guest is based. She's a candidate at the University of Melbourne in the School of Culture and Communication, and she's got a thesis which she identifies as specific to pornographic works from the 18th to the early 20th century. We're going to get the exact name of the thesis. She's a PhD candidate. She's a big deal on TikTok. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's a big deal in the podcast world. She has a huge following, and it's all about kinky history, which basically explores the evolution of human sexual history, which I believe she says is the history they didn't teach you in high school. And um, she's got over a couple of million followers, and it's very exciting to have her on board the Batuta Rabia podcast. Here's my James. Thanks for joining us. Hello, I'm blushing. What an intro. <laughs> There's a couple of novels in there as well. There's Stop TED it. Talks, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but um, look, we don't have time to go through all of that today. Yeah, it's great to have you on, and um, looking forward to talking about, as you said, stuff that doesn't get taught in the history of schools. What made you get interested in? in the history of sex, eroticism, all that sort of stuff? What a great question. My therapist is actually still working through that. So. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a Benny Benassi film clip or something like that. Uh, early teenage years, Channel V, eyes wide open. <laughs> yeah. Mine was um, McCavity in Cats. Oh, my God. He was sexy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. That is such a specific sexual awakening and I relate to it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And the Rum Tum Tugger. I kind of. Yeah. I mean, no, that's, that's more... no, no, that's who I mean. Rum Tum Tugger. But he was the sexy one. He was the yeah. sexy one. McCavity yeah. was like bad boy cat. Oh, okay. Maybe I had, I liked a few of the cats in Cats. This is when people will find out that they're actually furries. Um, and, and <laughs> <laughs> but it is absolutely wonderful to be here today. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much for having so me. So there was no specific awakening, but surely throughout the years you would have gone, okay, this is something that particularly starts to interest me. Yes. Was it something you found at university, later years of high school? How did it kind of happen? It happened because I have this compulsive need to find out what I'm not allowed to talk about. So uh-huh. every time we're in like university, um, I studied like history and literature. And whenever we got to that point, uh, reading a book that people were like, and okay, we're good now. We probably won't go any further today. I'm like, what's further? Is it a penis? And it always It's always a penis. It's always a penis. It always is a penis. And so that is kind of how I ended up, like, I started to dig myself a hole because I was like that person who would write about all of the stuff that you're not meant to write about. And then once you got a name for that, in kind of academia, you can't really, like, caress sex you either sink or swim you just Mm. go straight into Mm. it and I very quickly accidentally became the sex girl because I always wanted to talk about all of these things that we don't normally talk about in history class and then here we are now I started to post it on the internet (laughs) and there you go and the TikTok algorithm took off but was there a particular type of person in university who was saying don't go any further or was that just kind of the way it is? Because mm. the idea I had of university was that it's something that people go to to expand ideas mm. and learn all sorts of stuff and go down different areas of expertise. Was there a particular type of person that was pushing back or was just that's just the way it kind of was in literature? I think – most universities now are very, very liberal minded, you know, mm. and you will have like the study of sex and gender and everything and quite open conversations. But there's always going to be conversations that are going to be quite controversial. And when it comes to talking about sex in any capacity, whether that's like famous figures and, you know, recognizing that maybe they had a kink or a fetish, it's seen as something that's not as important to recognize when we're yeah. talking about mm. this great philosopher 
is it really important that he like to be spanked? And in my view, it is. And you say yes. And yes, I say it is yes. Quite important. But do you think it's because these people are put on a pedestal and that kind of humanizes them too much? And, and absolutely, you know, uh, we don't want to know that these great thinkers and these geniuses actually have some weird things that they're into. Absolutely, it straight away humanizes them. Mm. When you see something like you know James Joyce, and you're like, this man wrote one of the greatest books in literary history. And he wrote letters to his wife about how much he loves the smell of her farts. Mm. You know, those two things are kind of divorced from one another. But I mm. think the story is so much more interesting when we put them together and we recognise that these people who have done such incredible things and actually changed the course of history are as weird and freaky as we are. Because, I mean, if James Joyce can do that, why can't we also write the greatest book of history and still get off to the Rum Tum Tugger? You know what I'm saying? Thank like, you. Yeah. <laughs> do you reckon people who are – I've always saw people who are geniuses are more likely to be really weird because their brain works differently. They've done some really interesting correlations about that. And it has to do with, I guess, like you, you, how much your imagination and everything is actually coming into the play and having to be continually mentally and physically mm. stimulated at the same time. So they haven't quite worked out the exact reason, but a lot of people in the BDSM community tend to you know, test well on you know IQ tests and everything. It's, it's a very strange correlation, mm. potentially not a causation, but there's something there. There's a string, strong correlation as well, isn't there, between overall satisfaction with life and comfortableness and security and BDSM as well, isn't there? Yes, yes. Um, and it one of those, you know, kind of what we think is the connection there is that a lot of people who are in BDSM or kink relationships, there is a really big emphasis on communication and trust and all of those things. So if you're kind of intuitive enough to be able to enter into that relationship and enter into it well, you're probably also good at communicating other aspects of your life. You know, mm -hmm. that's not a skills that are solely set in the bedroom. If you value consent and communication and trust, that's going to go into all aspects of life. So yeah, there is a mm. well-being thing there. Maybe a bit of a novice question here, but how would you define kink? Because kink is mm -hmm. something that's not straight, right? It's something that's not quite on the well-beaten path. But yeah. what is the traditional definition of that and how much has it changed over time? Well, it's changed drastically over time. You know, today we recognise kink as a sexual behaviour or something that mm. kind of deviates from the norm. But if we go back 200 years ago when that kind of started to be used as a term or a concept, um, that was actually something that was put in place to diagnose. Yeah, right. It was meant to be, you know, it wasn't something like today that we kind of find ourselves like we shouldn't kink shame, blah, blah, blah. We'd be empowered by it. Back in the day, um, it was you know, Freud and Kraft Ebbing who kind of come in and they're like, we need to diagnose people with, like, mental disorders. So this was a mental disorder. Isn't Pretty his much. always, oh, you want to fuck your mom? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It always comes back to that. Everything looks like a penis and you want to fuck your mom. Yeah. And that's, like, Freud 101. Like, yeah. that, you can stop there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't need to read any of his books. That's all you need to know. Literally. Yeah. You can always guess the ending. Like, even when I'm just like, okay, I wonder if Freud ever had thoughts on the foot fetish. And it's like... Uh, yes, he did. He thought that feet look like penises and you would see the foot of your mother and want to fuck your mum. And it's yeah. just like, okay, everything will come back to those two things. Mm. Done. <laughs> 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 Very interesting figure. Um, who else is there out there that we might not yeah. know about? Who, you mentioned who, James who's Joyce. Who's a big horn dog from history you reckon who would surprise people? <laughs> um, big horn dogs from history that I think surprise people, um, always Albert Einstein. Um, mm. that, you know, we, we've just talked about high Big IQ and education. Big on him. Moustache on him. Yeah. 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 And you've got some pull on that hair, I'll be mm. honest. Like yeah. that's <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of doggy for Einstein. Um, but he was really uh, – he had this whole philosophy about love and relationships and he was all for free love. Like he writes that monogamy is the bitter fruit for everyone involved and we would all be better off and more satisfied if we could love everyone mm. and go where our – ways takers mm. at the same time he was okay with him doing that but not his wives so oh, gross. that's the case isn't yeah. It? yeah it always is but his letters are really interesting because when we talk about you know einstein's always used as, as this person that's just like yeah he's like high on that pedestal most intelligent person ever like you think like einstein einstein 
would have hated the idea of like, you know, the marriage and everything that we have yeah. today and mm. this kind of, I guess, war on polyamory that's starting to emerge. Like he was all for that. <laughs> the theory of polygamy. Yeah, yeah. Like mm. fuck the theory of relativity. Yeah. Um, also, he did, uh, you know, he was married to his cousin. So it's kind of the theory of relatives. But um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was a little bit more common back in the day, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. Not as stigmatized back then. No, everyone was married to their cousin. <laughs> 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 One of the things I've started to do online rather than being like, you know, Queen Victoria had a really good sex life with her husband. I will just say, you know, Queen Victoria had a really good sex life with her first cousin because I think we <laughs> kind of forget that all of these people were cousins like at every stage. So love yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> things, would you say, like I remember when I was doing um, ancient history yeah, and studying like Caligula and all those people mm-hmm, and it mm-hmm, seems mm-hmm. like in my head I'm like, I feel like they were more open with sexuality, more messed Mm -hmm. up then. And I feel like we're actually a little bit more prudish now. Do you think that's correct or... I think there's an argument both ways and I that's one of the things that I think is so interesting about teaching sex history is that mm. it becomes very circular. You know, we tend to see ourselves mm. going from this like repressed dark age where we only had missionary with our husband and to now the chastity belt. Yeah, 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 all yeah. the chastity yeah. belt stuff and now, you know, we're back here having sex with everyone. But when you go back to ancient times, there is such a different concept about gender and identity and sexuality. You have people like Julius Caesar who are, you know, famously having rumoured affairs with, like, King Nicomedes and cross-dressing in his palace and Mm. being known as every man's woman and every woman's man, you know, and having uh, affairs left, right and centre, quite kinky depictions of these scenes, you know. Mm. We have plenty of depictions of flagellation and whipping for erotic enjoyment from these times. We have dildos from these times. We have, you know, sex isn't something that we've like newly discovered. Mm. Mm. And actually, I think uh, in an age before technology and a lot of distractions, we were a lot more invested in making it more pleasurable. You don't have like TikTok to scroll on. You're like, oh, I'm bored. I've got to you know, um, yeah. find something to do. Fucking Nicometers. Like, <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do today. <laughs> I hope there wasn't a PG rating on this podcast. <laughs> we'll, put, I we'll think, put like a message yeah, at the start. Because yeah, right. uh, Wendell was saying to me before, he's like, F.E., we got to be careful, you know, people who listen to the podcast, we usually just have UFC fighters and musicians <laughs> and now it's going to be like, rimming! <laughs> Full noise rimming. Dildos! Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask there, you touched on Effie that we have all these stories from a few thousand years ago about sexuality and different things that was happening and where we're at now. Obviously, there's a big thing mm-hmm. called religion, which got in the way for a couple of thousand <laughs> years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that must have played a massive factor in what it is to be sexual and talk about sexuality and all that sort of stuff as well. Massively so. So when we go back, there's a few kind of tipping points, just the tip, um, mm-hmm. that I would kind of mark in the history that really change what it means today. And one of those is around the time of like Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, who goes through every part of the body and kind of identifies what its purpose is. And mm-hmm. the point of doing that was to say, if it wasn't fulfilling its purpose, it was bad, evil. And if it was fulfilling its purpose, it was good. If your legs can walk, they're good legs. And if you can't walk, they're evil legs. It was basically as simple as that. And so when it came to like genitals, he was like, their purpose is procreation. Anything else? evil sin Mm. um but that means you know anything else of your penis like you can't perform puppetry of the penis which you know if you've ever been to that show (laughs) bloody brilliant i would like to see that show my nan's been 17 times she's really obsessed with it thirsty nan yeah (laughs) she bought us all tickets when it came to australia and i was like okay this is random and she's like no no no, me and your granddad go every time it's around i'm like "Mm, cool yeah yeah, i've been reading that you um so your family actually sounds incredibly fun i want to hang out with or, you know, your mum and your grandma. But um, I read that you've been doing a sextistic series with your mum. Yes. Mom. Can you tell us about that? I absolutely can. Yes. Um, so my mum is a statistician. She is absolutely brilliant. Like we're talking one of the first women to graduate with a PhD from Cambridge in maths. Like she is wow. insanely cool. Mm. And along this journey of kinky history, um, doing all of these lessons on TikTok about the history of sex and all of it, there was one night that she's like, you know, have you ever thought about maybe adding in some modern stats so we can kind of contextualize it? And I was like, I would love to, mum, but you know, I gave up. Maths in year 11 and I'm never looking <laughs> back. Um, so I'm not going to teach that. 
And she just kind of like launched this giant pile of papers being like, that's okay, honey. Like I've done all your research for you. Oh, um, thanks, and mom. I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> and I was like, do you want to do this together then? And she's like, oh, you know, if you're asking, sure. Like I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely do it. I've actually got some costumes here now. <laughs> so do you want to like, and we ended up getting drunk on a bottle of wine um, and submitting a application video to Screen Australia to be like, hey, would you actually fund this series that we've come up with right now, uh, right here, right now? And they did. And so we created Sex Statistics, which has been a wonderful way to contextualise like what's happening in modern day Australia, America, UK, with all of these stories from history and, you know, kind of understanding what it means today, you know, and I think I'm in a very lucky position because I'll just get text messages from my mum to be like, hey, honey, did you know that everyone in Melbourne's rooming a lot more than they did 12 <laughs> years ago? <laughs> um, and, you know, that's a wonderful relationship. And well, one day I just got this thing being like, hi, honey, um, I'm going to come over. I'm nearly done. I'm just finishing up masturbation and then I will be right with you. And it's just like out as of in, context. As in, as in researching <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just come up completely out of context. But it gave something to the work we were doing that I think is so important because you can't learn anything from today if you don't put the past and present in conversation. Mm. And it's so incredible to even things like vibrator use is going up for guys. And that is a great stat because 100 years ago, vibrators were invented for men. Mm. And then were we, they? They were. Oh. They were invented for men to cure their impotence. So we were using va- masturbators, um, masturbators, mm-hmm. we were kind of masturbating men with vibrators oh, okay. to increase their fertility um, mm. back in the 1800s. And then we stopped using them altogether for guys because it got associated with being a womanly product. And now all of a sudden men are started to use them for pleasure. Like that's an interesting story from history about mm. like one household product. Mm. Stats and sex. (laughs) That is very interesting about vibrators. I did not know that. Are there any prudes in your family? Are there any like good good Catholics or is there the black sheep of the family who's like I don't want to talk about sex, guys? Or is everyone awakened? Obviously, you've got your nan and your pop. You just spoke about who are living it up. Are there? Is there anyone in the family, or is it all just pretty? Pretty free flowing. It's a very free flowing family. Ironically, my mum did go to a convent school. Like she was yeah. raised Catholic by my nan and granddad, who I've mentioned at the puppetry of the penis, mm. who are not Catholic, but they were so worried that they've done the wrong thing in being atheists that they sent her to a convent. Yeah instilled her with all of this Catholic guilt that no one else in the family has, mm. which is really interesting. It's a weird place to be. It really is. And then is. you're going to go one of two ways after school. You're either going to go hard one way or hard the other way. I yeah. Feel like. And, like, all of the time that I was growing up, mum used to, like, still have all of this, like, Catholic guilt. And it's yeah. only until recent times that mum's like, yeah, free love. You know, I think uh, she's just had her teenage years now. <laughs> Maybe it's be you know, doing this with you. She's, you know, finding more things about herself. Uh, but I think, you know, even in the experience that she's talked about, having conversations now in, I won't say how old she is, I'll get absolutely <laughs> murdered. But having all of those conversations now, she is learning so much about herself and about pleasure and about love and relationships. And she has just, you know, one day she just broke down crying. She's like, I'm so grateful that your generation are doing this now. And it's not going to take you until however old I am to be able to experience the joys of pleasure and love and a loving relationship with whoever you want. I, you know, and I think that's so special about what we do today just talking about all of this Mm. so openly on a PG podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to ask, TikTok's your biggest platform and watching it kind of grow Mm. TikTok as a platform over the last kind of couple of years, it seems to be a platform where people talk about stuff like sexuality Mm -hmm. and talk about all sorts of stuff much more than Instagram and Facebook Mm -hmm. and it seems to be obviously you can have all of the different little niches and wormholes and everyone's TikTok algorithm looks completely different (laughs) different, you know you'll have Pedro Pedro. Pascal I've been telling Wendell it's just Pedro Pascal someone will have masculine lesbians that's a new one for me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there'll be TikToks. There'll be people who are just watching carpet cleaning videos, and there'll be people oh God, with like boomer jokes. Have you yes. Seen? yes. Yeah. But there cleaning. are some people; their whole feed just looks like that. Then there's yeah. pimple popping. There's a mixture of all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> a lot of pimple popping. Yeah. What do you reckon TikTok has done in terms of progressing society in regards to talking about this sort of stuff mm. and making it more of an open conversation that you just spoke about? 
I think it's changed everything. Mm. And one of the reasons that I think it's done so is that it came into effect and it was still kind of a toddler going through this identity crisis when, you know, people, I suppose, of my generation have started to come on and help invent it. You know, when I came on to TikTok in 2020, no one knew what it was going to be. Mm. And it also felt very... um, like it was quite a privilege to kind of be one of the grassroots creators here in Australia because we got to guide what it was going to end up looking like. You know, when I first began, there was one other educational creator that I could name. And when you have this kind of new voice deciding, I know it's like a mega corporation, but guiding what something is going to be, there was a strong need for conversation that suddenly came out of this. Like people were wanting a platform to talk. They were wanting a platform to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's so much easier, I think, to start fresh and a brand new conversation than you know something like Facebook or Instagram which have been very much established and it's very hard to be like hey I'm actually going to talk about sex here now and we're all going to talk about sex and it's going to be a sex positive space whereas TikTok just had that like at the time of my TED talk I mentioned the fact that kink talk had nearly 400 billion views oh like, my god yes wow there was a huge amount of people and there was a considerable uh, same number on hashtag learn on TikTok that are marking that they are coming onto this platform to find community. And you know what you're saying about the different algorithms mm. is that it is so much easier to find your community and to find your niche because you can connect with all of these brilliant minds and people around the world who are sharing similar experiences to you because of that tailored algorithm. The algorithm, algorithm. is fantastic. The yes. One, yeah. Do you find... Um, because you're discussing sex, do you get censored? <laughs> I imagine you would be. Yeah. It was – the team here in uh, TikTok Australia have actually been brilliant. So when I started, I think nearly every second video was getting taken down. I was covering everything I was doing. I was using euphemisms left, right and centre. And quite early on in my experience on TikTok, uh, the team from Australia reached out to me and they're like, we love what you're doing. We see value in what you're doing. We want to work together to see how kinky history can exist on this platform in a way that's going to be beneficial to both of us. And, you know, also while recognising that this is currently a 13 plus platform. Yeah. And we kind of collaboratively work together to get kinky history to work on TikTok, which is so special. Like we talked about where is the limit? What can we say? What can't we say? When is censorship important in considering that anyone of any age could potentially find this content? Mm. And when has it gone too far? So I think I was really, really lucky. Occasionally now, um, you know, something will get taken down and I'll kind of text TikTok and I'll be like, hey, you know, my video got taken down. And they're like, Esme, you were literally reading porn on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Okay>. touche. <laughs> but it was like, but it's like 200 years old. <laughs> they're like, it's still porn. Um, I was like, there. So, you know, there is a line that you have to be conscious of. I think it's just been a privilege to be able to work with them to kind of establish where that line is. Because we do need open conversations, but we also do you need to protect people who potentially don't want to stumble onto that. So, hmm. yeah, yeah, right. So TikTok's been pretty good in terms of working with you in regards to that. Really good. As opposed to Instagram, which is just like delete anything that looks like <laughs> a nipple. And then they, they hate <laughs> nipples. Instagram absolutely hates pepperoni nipples. on pizza. Oh no, that's a nipple. Yeah, it's gone. A nipple. Get it off. Did you see that they're going to change this? Are but, they? Yeah. There's been a new thing uh, that I think you know came from the gods that be at Meta that was announced that they've been overruled about the nipple situation because what? they you know obviously they take down anything that looks like nipples and this was becoming an issue with you know the transgender community in particular who were saying you're still marking this as a female nipple Mm. I'm a man and because of you know their voices on this situation nipple erasure is actually going to be changed on all of their platforms Um, which is something that happened this week so Mm. you know breaking news free the nipple free the nipple Miley Cyrus is finally like her moment is here I mean like they had Tommy Lee's penis on there for such a long time they really did because i kept checking in to be like is it gone yet i love and that you're like, like this not. is for educational black yeah, reasons like, scientific reasons exactly. checking on the penis exactly. I'm just, <laughs> i need to make sure that instagram's doing their job so i'm yeah. just gonna check in you were really worried about that i was really worried about the children seeing it but they had that up for like seven hours and it was right there like you knew what it was a monster yeah. hog um <laughs> you have a huge amount of information inside your brain in regards to the stuff we've spoken about today. 
where do you find it? What, like <laughs> what kind of materials are you studying, looking at, and what rabbit holes are you going down to find all this stuff? <laughs> so many rabbit holes. Yeah. Like the rabbit holes with like cobwebs on them. Like no one yeah. has been down there. But are, are you going to library? Like are you needing to find this stuff in libraries? Are you being able to find it on like the internet? Like mm-hmm. where, where, how do you get it all? Uh, a lot of different places. Um, one of the very, I think, you know, boring side of my job is that on TikTok it all looks very like fun and exciting. I'm like, I found a penis. Um, but then my daily life is <laughs> me in archives, yeah. like following up a reference and then trying to find it and occasionally having to like scan through Finding documents. Finding the penis in the haystack. Oh, yeah. Do you know what? That is the perfect explanation. <laughs> like that is actually it's very it. very good. And you know, occasionally we'll, we'll get documents like scanned over from archives overseas. And so you're reading on a little laptop an old English document on your computer and it's the most atrocious hit your head against the wall kind of situation but occasionally in the course of doing this it will be like yes anyway then they all left and they had a bdsm kink party and that was the end Mm. and i'm like okay great we found the kink party like follow that up um then other stuff you know you just read normal books like one of my like the most famous examples that i'll give of this is jean-jacques rousseau very Mm. famous philosopher lots of people read him at school you know very well known He wrote an entire book at the end of his life called Confessions where he's like, yeah, so I've done a lot of great things in my life. Also, I really love to be spanked because I used to be spanked as a kid. I'll always enter into these uh, relationships where I'm called Little One and she's called Mama. And occasionally I like to moony people in public and see if they will spank me. Um, Anyway, just writing this down because I thought, you know, you should know this. May as well. About to die. About to Put die. That out, yeah. Put it out there. And he kind of writes it like, you know, I hope that someone will one day be able to make sense of my sex life in comparison with my philosophy. And, you know, that stuff is just there. We just mm. haven't spoken about it. You know, we'll read every single one of his works in university or in high school, but we kind of leave confessions out. And that's not one that I have to search very far for, mm. which I think is what shocks a lot of people. Um, even like the letters, the fart letters of James Joyce, they're all accessible to the public. We just don't talk about mm. them. And so some things just kind of, for lack of a better term, land on my lap. Yeah. <laughs> like- <laughs> so you find some of that stuff there in plain sight and then other stuff there might be 20 hours at a library for uh, yeah. one video on TikTok that people might see. Honestly, and do you know what's so annoying? It's always the ones that like I've done so much work on and they'll like they get don't no go views. Off. Yeah. No. Oh, that's so annoying. Always. Yeah. Always. Where occasionally someone's like, oh my God, did you see that Catherine the Great used to have a penis chair? And I'm like, Catherine the Great had a penis chair. And everyone's like, yes. <laughs> 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 Could have found that myself, but yes. <laughs> like <Yeah>. penis chair. <laughs> Penis chair in terms of it looked like a penis or... It's uh, decorated with uh, penises and depictions of people giving each other cunnilingus yep. and the devil also being involved. Oh. And a table. I'm going to have to show you this table. Yeah. Um, and a table that is made of penises for legs with boobies as... Um, yeah. And apparently this was found when her palace was raided all the way in the 19, uh, 1942 by German soldiers. Apparently these were still inside the palace left over from Catherine the Great's time and had been hidden and we know this because the German soldiers top, stopped to take pictures because they were so <laughs> shocked <laughs> by what they saw. Um, so we love that for <laughs> Catherine love the Great. That for Catherine, absolutely. I don't think they're going to cover it in the crown, but I really hope they do. Oh, that'd be great, <laughs> wouldn't it? Or maybe just like... They don't have to mention it, but just have that table there and you can kind of see it. Yeah, yeah. just in the background of yeah. the great, yeah. Where does Bridgerton um, oh, fit into all of this? Yeah. Quite a popular to to TV show this over one. the last couple of years. Because we um, wrote similar articles about this one. Did we? Because I was watching it and I was watching season two mm-hmm. and I loved Anthony. I thought he yep. was beautiful. But I remember thinking, okay, he goes to brothels all the Mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. and I don't know if Viscount would have access to contraception like what's going on here like they're they're you know engaging in activities that I don't know how frequently you know they bathe back in the day but all (laughs) I could think of would be that if we were realistic about it people would smell bad and everyone would have syphilis and for those who don't know Bridgerton very popular over the last couple of years tv show period drama 
Mm-hmm. Um, I always find that term funny, period, period drama. drama. By the way, I don't <laughs> quite understand why I can't be like Victorian era drama or That's whatever. That's just me once um, a month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a period drama with a twist. It's like it's saucy. all It's sexy. It's, it's saucy. saucy. It's yeah, extravagant. Yeah. All sorts of stuff is going on. So it's very different to the traditional like Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte <laughs> kind of stuff. I think that's sexy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, it's it's so true. There was a study done um, in hindsight where two researchers have kind of come across and found that one in five people in London would have had syphilis at the time that Bridgerton is set. That's in the a Regency really bad era. one, isn't it? It was because syphilis at the time was so much more aggressive than we know it today. And there was no cure until the 1900s when we have penicillin. So once you had syphilis, you know, there was a very famous saying and it was, one night with Venus and a lifetime with Mercury because Mercury was the only thing that they used to help syphilis, which we kind of know now was probably a lot worse for Mm. them. So people would literally sit on Mercury with the steam coming up into their hoo-ha or their what's you may call it and they would just like sit and ingest mercury for a really long period of time now syphilis at the time would cause it was quite related to um leprosy in some Mm. ways you know we're we're talking flaking skin a lot of people's noses would fall off and hair loss which is one of the reasons that we had so many powdered wigs why they came into fashion in that Mm. era was to hide hair loss and because of this Nearly everyone in a court was then required to wear a wig, so you wouldn't know which ones had Does syphilis. Does Voldemort have syphilis? Maybe because his nose is gone and he's and bald. Yeah. Do you know what new fan fiction? Voldemort, Voldemort had yep. syphilis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Love that. Yeah, that's it. That, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, I'll subscribe. The I'll seven subscribe. Whores. Can, can, you guys, can, you give it, can you give the rundown on fan fiction for those who may not be aware of it in regards yes. to Harry Potter? Is there a lot of fan fiction that isn't erotic? I'm not a Harry Potter guy, so I'm not completely across this sort of stuff. Or is it mostly just erotic stuff, the fan fiction? Um, mainly erotic. Yeah. Mainly erotic. Okay. I feel like they, they've kind of become synonymous now. Mm. That you the do. non-erotic stuff's left to J.K. Rowling and then the fans do the erotic yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. And then Draco Malfoy said, like, you know. Yeah, it's usually Draco, I think. It's yeah. always Draco. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good-looking man, Draco. He, well, sorry, not a man, is he really? Is he? What's actually what is the go there? Fan fiction. They're all fucking kids. I know you were kids when you were watching it and it was like similar ages. But then again, like so much of what I'm thinking, like euphoria, sex education, everything now is like mm. really popular teenage, teenage sex yeah, dramas. Yeah. Like I don't know if anyone else occasionally finds that weird, but like I, I find it incredibly weird yeah. and it always Rubs me up the wrong way. I feel yeah. like it makes sense when yeah. you're a 16 or 17 year old and you're seeing these 16, 17 year olds on TV yeah. doing the stuff you dream about and wanted to do. <laughs> like, if you're getting like, adults to play teenagers, <laughs> like you're getting adults to play teenagers who are engaging in all these activities. And But uh, I don't know. I think I think it's a bit a bit of, off. Yeah, I think one show that has done it really well, I, I am a big fan of Sex Education on mm. Netflix, um, mainly because, you know, as the name implies, a lot of it is about sex education and they're seeing these experiences with, you know, the person who I want to be when I grow up, which is one of their mums who is a sex yes. educator. Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah, and she's kind of, you know, you hear these two sides of it. And I think that's a, a good show in terms of, like, they are still teenagers. We're not going to forget that they're teenagers. It's not like euphoria. It's when- not gratuitous. Like, we don't have boobs every episode. Yes. Whereas I feel like Euphoria sexualizes the characters a lot more. Yeah, mm. big time. I mean, I don't know if they have time to go to school. Like every time How are they passing the Are they gra- passing? I don't, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is now a Euphoria podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, our very own Otis, Otis of TikTok. Sex education. Oh, of Otis. course. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that maybe doesn't work as a reference. <laughs> um, yeah, you're Otis. Oh, oh, oh I'm mom. Otis. Or his yeah. Mom. I want to be the gene. I want oh, to be the, be the gene, gene of TikTok. Yeah. 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 As yeah. soon as I turned on that first episode, I was literally there. I'm like, it's like looking into a mirror of my future. Like, that's what I want to be. If I ever have kids, mm. I just want to be like, hey, honey, like, have you used a, used a condom recently? Yeah. <laughs> Get a nice little place up in Dalesford or something like that yeah. when you head out of Melbourne. I'm yeah, not a okay. cool mom. I'm always going to say I'm not a cool mom. I'm yeah, a regular yeah. mom, but like, that's all right. Like. <laughs> 
Well, Jean from Sex Education, thank you very much for joining us. Esme James, it was a pleasure. That was very interesting. Learned thank you so much for having me to talk. Yeah, syphilis so much and fun. Everything.